Now, I want to tell you the story about our very first campaign. Do you know the little man called Francois Duplessis? Have you seen him on television, occasionally on AD? Now, he's one of the kindest, sweetest men that I know. I don't know many people as kind and as sweet as he. I've never, ever, in 26 years, heard him say anything bad or negative about anyone else. If someone was mean to him, I would go to him and say, how dare they speak like that to you? And then he would say, even if it was the high priest, he would say, my high priest has not had me flogged yet. So he always has a kind word, even under the worst of circumstances. And the very first time we had a campaign, we had a campaign in a little town called Paul. Now, I was brand new to this. I come out of atheism, and uh, now I was on the other side of this war game. And I think God wanted me to understand that there are principalities and powers that are working behind the scenes in this war. So I had to drive every evening after work, because I worked at the university, and we took part in this evangelistic campaign, and it was evening lectures in this town, and we had to drive about 50 kilometers there and 50 kilometers back, maybe a little less, maybe 35, run right about there. And I would drive to this town, and we had a double attack or a double approach. He started in one hall with the old Advent message, Dead Men Do Tell Tales. It's about the archaeological approach. And a week or two later, I was to start with a health seminar. And so we wanted to invite the people to this church. Now, before we even started, in this church, there were only about four active members still. That's why we wanted to do a campaign then. And there were about 20 or so backsliders who never, ever came to church anymore. And so we had to first prepare this church, but they didn't want to. They didn't want to take part in evangelism. They had had it, and the backsliders were, well, they were difficult people. One of them uh, was a lady who was married to a non-Adventist, and whenever somebody went to visit them from the church, he would throw things at them, rocks and bricks and once he was sitting on the roof and a pastor came and visited and he tore the roof tiles off the roof to throw at the pastor. It's a difficult place, very difficult place to start off with. And when I drove there in the evenings and I drove back, in between the towns in the middle of nowhere, my car would stop. I, have I told you this story before? No. My car would stop and all the lights would go off and nothing would happen. And then I'd pray, because it's late at night, you can't go anywhere, there's nowhere you can walk to, it's just dark all around. And I'd wait 20 minutes, sometimes half an hour, sometimes one hour, hoping some car would come by and say, I've got a problem, and then my lights would come on, and I'd drive home. And every night, when I came to that particular spot, the exact same spot, the same thing would happen. And this happened night after night after night. And we had some horrendous experience. Once we were coming back from church, it was a Sabbath, my wife and I and the children in the car, and we came to this spot, and I realized, oh, here's our spot. Now it's the day, so it's not so bad. But there was a dog sitting in the road. Some bull master of a beautiful dog and he was sitting in the, in the opposite lane to the one in which I was driving. And I said, you know, that dog 
is sitting at exactly the spot where my car always stops at night. That dog's gonna run across the road just when I get there. So I'm gonna slow right down so that it doesn't happen. So whatever happens, it's not gonna be me that runs over this dog. And a big truck, like a pickup truck, like one of yours, came from the front and the dog was sitting in his lane and I thought this person would now stop. And as we got to the dog, he drove over the dog. And the dog was in pieces. And I was so furious because I thought, that's such a horrendously mean thing to do. And I turned around and we raced after this car, but we couldn't see anyone inside. And in the distance, there was a, a four-way crossing, and those were the only roads. There's nothing where you can drive in, and when we got there, he was gone. You couldn't see him anywhere. So these are the things that happen. And as we got into the campaign, the strangest things started happening. And one thing that I'd like to point out is this is the first campaign in South Africa that was multiracial. It was just at the switch over of the political situation, and we had decided that we were going to have a multiracial campaign. So we had the town hall, and whoever comes is welcome, no matter what tribe or race or creed they consisted of they were going to be welcome. Now, as we did the campaign, there were some interesting side stories. Perhaps before I get to that story, first a side story. A man came to Francois's lectures. I hadn't started yet. And he became interested, and he started seeing these truths. And eventually he decided, this is it, this is the truth, I want to follow this truth. And he went home and he told his wife, I want to follow this truth. And his wife went ballistic. She was totally anti. And so he invited Francois Duplessis to come and visit there to explain to his wife what this was all about. And he went, so she brought them tea. And when she brought the tea, she put it on the floor at the entrance, almost in the passage, she put it on the floor, and she said to Francois, if you are from that Seventh-day Adventist church, you can come and drink your tea like a dog from the floor. I won't serve you. That was the attitude. And eventually, it became so miserable that he didn't come anymore. And then a short while later, I started with the health messages in another venue, and she attended those lectures. And she came to the lectures, and she listened, and she accepted the truth. And so she went home to her husband, and she says, I'm so excited. I've discovered you were right all along. This is the truth. We must go to this church. And the husband says, if you go to that church, I'm through with you. I'm throwing you out of the house. You prevented me, I'll prevent you. And then he, she said, but we must go. She and her daughter attended those lectures. She says, we must go, we must go. And then he said, out of the bedroom. And he threw her out. And then she lay that night in the room and she was crying, and she was wondering and thinking, is this right? It's causing so much tension. Is it worthwhile? Is it true that you must keep the Sabbath and the commandments and all of these issues? And then she heard a voice calling her name, and she thought, ah, my husband has had a change of mind. And she went to the bedroom, but there he was, snoring. So she went back to the room and sat upright, and she heard her name, and she said, who's calling me at this time of night? And she went and looked whether there was someone at the window, maybe some family member had a problem or something, and there was nothing. And she sat down again, 
And she listened, and then she heard her name again, and then she said, yes. And then almost like in a vision, she saw two tablets of stone come down before her, and the voice said, keep the commandments of God. And she was baptized, she and her daughter. Just to run ahead a little bit, for one year, that man made her life a misery. He mellowed a little bit later, and he would condescend occasionally to bring people with a car that lived nearby to the church, but he never put his foot in the church. And on one of these occasions, it was raining, it brought people, and he was sitting outside. He refused to put his foot in the church, but he was willing that his wife was there or something. Francois went out to him and said, why don't you come inside? It's so cold here. You don't have to take part in the service. We're doing a baptism, but you know. And it was so cold, so he said, all right. So he went and sat in the back. And after the service, when we all went out and we locked the door, he said, I missed my baptism. I'm so stubborn. So Francois said, no, you haven't missed your baptism. We opened the church and he too was baptized. So this is how God works. So I, I experienced all these miracles. I experienced this thing with the car stopping every night. And in the middle of this, there was, a, there was another man who today is active in the work. He even served as pastor for some of our churches. And this man phoned me in a tremendous panic during this campaign. And he said to me, there's something seriously wrong. I phoned Francois Duplessis to ask him something. And a woman answered and screamed at me. And it was so demonic, and she screamed, I've got him where I want him. And I was such a fright, I put the phone down. Do you know anything about what's going on there? And I said, I have no idea. Now, I lived in a town separate from Francois, about 30 kilometers away from him. So I phoned, my wife was present in the house, and I phoned Francois, and I thought, no, what's going on here? And as I found him, a woman answered, and she laughed like a demon, ha! and she screeched over the phone, and she said, I've got him where I want him. I've got him where I want him. He's sitting on the floor. He's finished. And she laughed like a drain that my wife could hear her screeching over the phone at the distance as far as the back row of this church. And I slammed the phone down. I got a big fright. I thought, what's going on here? And I thought, did I have the wrong number? And I dialed again. And Francois's wife answered. And she was crying on the other side. I said, what's wrong over there? What's going on? She says she doesn't know, but Francois was sitting on the floor in the office, and he's not getting up. And so I said, we're coming. So we loaded the children in the car, and we rushed through there. And what had happened, he'd received so much opposition, because in that town where we were having the campaign, which is the town called Paul, the ministers of the other churches had put pressure on our conference to such an extent, and, and you must understand what power these people wielded, because in South Africa, church and state were one. In fact, the religion that was propagated, Calvinism, preached predestination and on the strength of that predestination, uh, they had connected it to racialism. So a meeting that was multiracial would arouse tremendous opposition, not only from the populace, but also from the churches. And so they'd put pressure on the conference, and they'd phoned Francois and told him that he must cease with his campaign forthwith, because it was causing too much trouble. 
Now we were experiencing these miracles and we decided, no, we're not going to stop. Or he decided he's not going to stop the campaign. No matter who tells him, even if the prime minister tells him, this is God's work and souls are at stake, he's carrying on. And so they made life so miserable for him that he became so depressed, he went and sat down and he couldn't get up. And when we got there, there he was, sitting in his office. And I said, what's wrong? And he, was, he couldn't get up. He couldn't move. It wasn't only spiritually, mentally. It was physically, he couldn't move. And that night, he had to do a lecture. And so we said to him, what are we going to do? And we prayed, and we prayed. And then uh, we had this friend of ours. We picked him up. And he was like in a fetal position. He was like, like this. He couldn't get up from this stance. And so we carried him. We carried him. He's a light little man. He's a short little man. We picked him up and we carried him to the car, put him in the car, drove him to the campaign, and we had to get him out in that same position. He couldn't get upright. He was down there. And we carried him into the hall and put him on the front chair. And by the time the meetings were to start, he still couldn't walk. We'd prayed, we'd done everything we could, and he could hardly talk. And we picked him up and carried him to the pulpit and put him next to the pulpit because he couldn't stand behind the pulpit because nobody could see him then. So we put him next to the pulpit and gave him the mic, and there he started to whisper his lecture. And he whispered his lecture. And as he lectured, his voice got stronger and stronger and stronger. And he rose up from the ground. And by the 15, 20 minutes into the lecture, he was the old Francois. Now, why would God permit such strange events to happen? And I realized we're not fighting against flesh and blood. These are real issues. Here are real demons that are working behind to the scene to counteract God's work. That vehicle that stopped, that car that came and crushed that dog in front of my children, my children were hysterical. They were afraid. They didn't ever want to go to that church again. And the devil did everything in his power to prevent us from going to that church and to those meetings. But it was to become even more fascinating because when the campaign finally came to an end, there were over 60 people that had made a decision to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, now, now you must understand the climate in Africa. The hatred against anything that was not state church was unbelievable. If a Seventh-day Adventist lived in a town and he passed away, then he was not allowed to be buried in the graveyards of the town. He had to be buried outside somewhere like a pauper because the church, the Dutch Reformed Church, would not allow such a violent, vicious sectarian to be buried in their churchyards or in the public churchyards. And the word of the ministers out there was law. So here, over 60 people come into this church, but it's the first multiracial church in the country. The first one. Now, this created quite some tension because people that accepted the church, some of them were white and some of them were not white. Now, the, the people that came in that were not white were of the colored race. The colored race. Now, the colored race 
in South Africa is a mixture between the white race and the Hottentot and Bushman races and also a mixture between the white race and the black race. So it is a mixture between the two because the history of South Africa is fascinating when the, the Boers first came to Africa they didn't have wives, so they had to make do with what was available, and that's how these races developed in southern Africa. But the prejudice was unbelievable. I mean, it was ensconced in, in law. And so the tensions broke out in this church. Terrific tensions and terrific infighting. And oh, Francois and I, we were just trying to put out the fires. And then some of the people in a meeting said, we cannot have a mixed church. It's not possible. Because the cultures are so different, we would never be able to worship God together. Some of these people, they have totally different music styles. Their rhythms are different. They don't read the Bible like we read. They will not be able to sing the hymns like we sing. They dress differently. It wouldn't, I said a lot of worse things that I won't want to repeat here. And we tried and we tried to reconcile these minds. There was just no way. And then they said, and if it gets worse, and black people come to this church, then it'll be total disaster, because then you have it even more so. And they mentioned all these things again. Now, not all of them were like that, but you had a hard core of people that had come in that wanted the truth, they wanted the Sabbath, they wanted all of those things, but they didn't want every nation, tribe, and tongue, and people. That was not acceptable. You know, it's like people that come in that say, we want all of this, we want the Sabbath, we want salvation, we want that, but this health reform, nah, we don't want that. Don't we have the same thing, you know? We're very selective in what we accept and what we don't accept. And it got to a point where the whole church was going to fall apart. All that work, all that pain, all that suffering, and the whole church was just going to disintegrate. And I was doing the sermon one morning, and it was a Sabbath. And actually, it's quite funny. In the one town, we had two towns where Francois was the pastor. The one was called Paul, and the other one was called Paro. Now, it sounds different, but in, in Afrikaans, it's paro and paro. And if you say it quickly, it's paro and paro. Paro and paro. So he would phone me and say, you're preaching in paro today, and I, I'm preaching in paro today, and I'd say, fine, thank you very much, and we'd end up in the wrong church. We'd end up both in the same church, and some of them, they were you know, 30, 40 kilometers apart, and, and you're supposed to start preaching, and you're in the wrong place. So it got very tricky. Anyway, he phoned me that day, and he said, you're preaching in parol. And I said, is it now peril, or is it peru? And he said, no, it's peril. So that's the church where we had this difficult church. So I went to this church that morning thinking, oh, we're going to have trouble again today. And there they were all sitting, and they were in fighting, and there was aggression. And I went to the front when it was time for me to do the service. And as I went to the front, a black lady walked in the back. Now every eye turned in horror because this was not a colored lady, she was black. Now, the colored people come in every shade of color from light to dark. But this one was a black person of the black race. And she was dressed immaculate. 
immaculately. Immaculately. My wife would remember the dress better than me. But every eye did that. And you could see the hair rising on some folks' heads. And she went and sat down relatively about there. And my wife was behind her and watching her. And then as the first hymn was, was mentioned, she got up with everyone else, and without a hymnal, she sang beautifully. And her voice rang across the audience. And we thought, this is strange, because these people had said what? They'll never be able to sing our hymns like we do. They have a totally different culture. We would have to teach them to sing the hymns. And she didn't even have a hymn ball. And she sang it beautifully. And she had a Bible in her hand. And I was preaching when I did the sermon. When I mentioned a Bible text, she's got it. And then she did everything that they said would not happen. She was immaculately dressed like any Westerner. She was singing our hymns as crystal clear and as sweet as a bell. None of the connotations and things that they thought would be involved was there. And then the second hymn and the third hymn, and it was like her voice was like a voice of an angel. And I was fascinated with her, and I kept looking at her. And I thought, wow, God, you sent a person to destroy these people's bigotousness. And after the sermon, what does the pastor do? He goes out the front, he goes down the aisle, and he stands at the back, and he greets the people at the back. Now the people come out the church, and we greet them, and I'm waiting for this lady because I want to ask her, where does she come from? And how come she's at this church? Because there was a black Seventh-day Adventist church in that town as well. Now, why did she come to this one if there was one there that she could have gone to? I want to know. And when all the people had left, she hadn't yet appeared. And I said to my wife, who, who stands next to me when we say goodbye, I said to her, where is she? she? She must still be in there. And so we went inside to look for her. No sign of her. There's nowhere else she could have gone in, out. And the ground is totally fenced. There's no way she has to come past me. There was no way it could be any other way. So I believe that God sent an angel, a black angel to destroy bigotry amongst God's people. And it wasn't very long. It was just two weeks or so, and all the troublemakers had departed. It was about 10 of them. They refused to stay in a church that was multiracial. That's how the first multiracial church started in South Africa. And what a privilege to serve a God who in the final events of this earth's history wants to bring together every race, tribe, and people and to create one nation under God that love him and keep his commandments. And that is what I wish for all of you, that you may understand that this is not just a message that we have. This is a separating message. This is a call to mankind to set aside all of these differences and conflicts and to come together under one banner. And the Bible says, they gathered themselves to the law of God. And if you keep the law of God, then you will love your neighbor as yourself. And you will no longer seek a place of supremacy. 
But I also learned something else that has caused quite a bit of strife. Listen to God before you listen to man. If God tells you to do something and someone else tells you to stop, and you know that this calling is from God. If he's telling you to do an evangelism and someone tries to stop it, it's not from God. No matter who it is who's trying to stop it, you have to obey God more than you have to obey man. And these early influences in my own evangelistic life showed me that if you do what is right, and if you persevere, there is no way that God will leave you and forsake you. He will be with you. And I've had so many occasions with the message that I bring where even our lives were in danger, and God would bring us through every single time. I will not forget in Slovenia, we were on the stage and the Orthodox militia decided to disrupt the meetings. They ran into our meetings, they ran onto our stage, and it was a huge hall. I mean, there were over a thousand people in that hall that had come to the meetings. They ran to the front, they grabbed the mic out of my hand, they shoved me aside. I had a small, tiny little blonde uh, interpreter, translator, and they shoved her aside and I went and stood in front of her and they told me to get off the stage and I refused. It wasn't their stage, this was God's stage. And they looked at the people and they said, if the people do not get out, they will come with their entire militia. Do you know that the, the church there, the Orthodox Church, has its own basic police force to make sure that nobody interferes in their backyard? And they said to the people, get out or we will come and beat you all up. And those people got up like one man. And I thought they were going to leave. No, no, they came forward and they said, no, you go out or we will beat you up. <laughs> and so the man backed off a little bit and he said, I'll be back in 15 minutes and we will wipe you all out. I'm going to fetch the backup troops. And the conference president, he was there, he found the police. And the police arrived. The chief of police arrived with all of his officers and 250 policemen. And they surrounded the entire hall with their policemen, fully armed, and the chief of police and his top brass sat in the front row of my meetings. Those people arrived with hundreds of people to come and attack our hall. And the chief of police in, in, took a law or told them that there was a law where he could arrest them and put them in jail for public violence without a trial for months. And so they didn't attack us, and I did that entire campaign under police protection. Amen. And that taught me something else. If your audience is too small, God will enlarge it. <laughs> so in this battle, let us stay faithful and let us preach the message. I've learned something else. And that is that the devil will always, always wage war if you preach God's truth. You will always be in a war. But you have to learn to accept the fact that you have no might over him, no control over him. You have to just go forward and leave the consequences to him. 
and he will not leave you nor forsake you. I remember we were doing this campaign and I was doing a campaign in uh, Cape Town and I was living in a town called Somerset West and during that campaign a prominent evangelist actually came into the truth. His whole family came into the truth. But the devil was so mean and he tried to make it impossible for me to do that campaign. And he doesn't normally under those circumstances attack me directly. He, he will attack my wife or he will attack my family. And so my wife had a, an operation and we warned the doctor about certain things and he ignored us totally and she nearly died after that operation. It was quite a thing. And uh, that night she was at home and I had the campaign going and the doctor came and said we must rush her to hospital. He, she doesn't think that she's going to survive. And while the doctor was working with my wife to try and stabilize internal bleeding, our cat was knocked over in the street and ran, jumped in through the window, jumped onto my little daughter's lap. My daughter was about six, seven years old, and the cat died on her lap. So I had a, a hysterical daughter in the one room, a dying wife in the other room. I had to leave all this, rush to the hospital, get my wife to the hospital. They did the um, emergency operations. They managed to save her life. She was in intensive care. And I said to her, I'm going to cancel my, my meeting tonight because I have to be with you. And she said, no, you will go. And I said, I cannot go, I will not go. She says, you will go. Because if this is from God, then God will take care of me. The doctor said to me, she will not be there when you get back. And I said, I'm staying. She said, no, you're not, you're going. And that night, that prominent evangelist made his decision. So this, this is an uphill battle. This is not an easy road to travel. She was so weak after that operation because she'd, she'd lost almost all her blood internally and they had to do the transfusion and everything went wrong in that operation. And I was not there. I had to do campaign. I, I was in the university teaching during the day and I was at campaign at night. And she had to cope with these things alone. She had to cope alone, and, and she was so weak, she couldn't go to the bathroom. She couldn't go to the bathroom alone. And we had no money, because after I had become a Seventh-day Adventist, I had, I had to experience how all my funds just went down the drain. And we were so poor, we had no money to get help or someone to look after her, and we were new and in the Adventist church, and you know, we are proud people. You eat your shoes before you ask someone for help. That's also stupid, by the way. <laughs> and she had to stay at home alone when I went to the university. Now, fortunately at the university, if your classes are finished, you can, you can nip home. It wasn't too far to help her. And so in the morning, I would prop her up in the bed and bring her uh, breakfast and feed her and get the kids ready and do all the things that a wife normally does. And then I would leave, but I wouldn't be able to come back, let's say, until after lunch. So I helped her with the bathroom things and hoped nothing would have to happen until I got back after lunch and I'd give her a little plate of food and... Uh, she always liked fruits and things like that, so she had fruit and bread and avo and all of these things right there next to her bed that she didn't have to get up because she was too weak to get up. 
And of course, she was alone in the home, the children in school, she's alone in home, no one to help her, she's weak, and she was feeling very, very depressed. And we had a dog and we had a cat, and uh, in, the, in those days it was quite safe in our country, so the back door was always open so that the dog and the cat had access to the house but could go to the, to the garden to do whatever they had to do. But she was so lonely. And as she was lying in the bed there, she heard a little pitter-patter coming down the passage. Now, this was very strange. What was this? And it came, and it came into the bedroom, and it was a squirrel. Now, she loves animals, and so she watched this squirrel. It was a wild squirrel. And the cat would chase wild squirrels and catch them and kill them. And this squirrel walked past the dog and past the cat. And the cat and the dog did nothing. And the squirrel would come, and the squirrel jumped onto her bed. And then the squirrel would come up to her, and it always happened around about lunchtime, and he'd come up to her plate. And so she would share her avocado with the squirrel, give him half, and he would eat half out of his little shell. And then he'd go lie next to her on the chair, stretch himself out in the sun and go to sleep for half an hour next to her. And this kept her buoyed up and happy. And this happened for six weeks, every single day. Every single day for six weeks, lunchtime, that little squirrel came down the passage, jumped onto her bed, comforted her, ate a little bit with her, slept with her, and then went out. And after six weeks, when she was capable to get up again and to start moving around the house and walking, the squirrel didn't come into the house anymore. He just stayed in the trees outside. And as she got stronger, one day she was standing there at the kitchen, and she looked out, and the squirrel was in the tree. And the squirrel came running down the tree, down the stem, and he came rushing into the house. And he ran up her leg, ran up her leg, onto her shoulder, ran down to the other side, down the other leg, and ran up, up, un, up onto the tree. And from that day on, the squirrel was gone. It never came back again. Now, what are the lessons in these stories? You know, God is in the detail. He's not only in the big things, he's in the little things. He cares about you. And that is what makes us so determined to carry on no matter what. Because it doesn't matter what, what the devil throws at you. God is there to comfort you. And we're still here, aren't we? Yes, sir. We're still here after all those times. I was lecturing in Durban. That's one of the big cities in South Africa. It's uh, about four times the size of Vancouver. <laughs> So you get an idea of what size it is. And I was lecturing at the University of Durban Westwell. We had the facilities there. And in the middle of my lecture series, and that was a, <laughs> it was a tough lecture series. It was still part of that total onslaught series that causes so much trouble. But it brings so many people. <laughs> so trouble, as long as there is fruit, is fine by me. And all of a sudden, they shouted, please rise, and everybody had to get up. And the queen, now not the British queen, but the African queen of the Zulu nation. Uh, the, the Zulu nation is divided into chiefdoms and into a kingdom. They're all related but the chief has different roles to the king. And the chief is, well, at that stage, and even today still, is Butalesi, Kacha Butalesi. He was also prime minister at one stage, parallel 
to Nelson Mandela. If Nelson Mandela went away, he would be the caretaker prime minister. And uh, he is in an Adventist family, that chief. He's not an Adventist, but his mother's an Adventist. Now, politically, it's probably not expedient for him to be um, an Adventist. But the queen was married to the king. And the queen is one of his 21 wives. They must understand it works like in the time of Esther. If the king calls and you resist, that's the end of you. You have to accept that. That's just part of it. But she arrived with her whole entourage in African dress, and she sat in the front row, and her name was Queen Mfonte, and she was a Seventh-day Adventist. She was the only Seventh-day Adventist in his family. All the other wives were non-Adventists. And so I started, I gave these lectures, and some of them, you know, have a lot of politics in them, as you know. And after the first lecture, she got up and she came to me and she said to me, do you mind if I sit in the back row because I cannot see so well in the front row? She asked me permission to change her seat. She was the queen. And so she phoned the king and asked him whether she could stay for another lecture, and he gave permission. Now, when, a, when that queen comes in, she doesn't come in by herself. Her bodyguards are there, about five or six bodyguards. Members of state are always with her to make sure everything is good and proper and right. So here was a whole entourage of high government officials in that meeting. And at the end, she asked me and she said, this message should go out to the entire world. It should be on every national television because I am the, in the inside and I know that these things are true. And will you please send me a complete set of your DVDs because I want our ruling echelon to know what this is all about. We sent it to her, but from then on you're working with public officials, so whether she actually got it or not, I do not know. But I do know that since then, I've had occasion to speak to the chief of police. I've had occasion to speak to very high government officials. I also know that this message is in the highest levels of governments in the world. It's in the highest embassy levels of the world. There are whole dossiers, dossiers on this message at the highest levels in the military. Even the soldiers in Iraq watch these messages. Don't underestimate God and how he works. Thank you.